Yo, 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 yo. yo. This is Benjamin's Room Podcast, and we live at Music Box Studio. You heard My homie KP, you did. And today we got a very, very special guest today. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Ah, uh, what up, what up, what up, world? This is uh, Wendell Monroe, a.k.a. Coach, uh, Coach Buddy, a.k.a. Hollywood. Uh, you know, y'all should know my background if you know me, so... I'm just here representing. <laughs> Welcome to the music box, my brother. It, uh, thanks, man. Appreciate man. it. Now, Coach Buddy is um, what can I say to people who to people that's from New Orleans? Let me say this: Coach Buddy is in New Orleans East, as close as you could get to um, an old school leader, right? When you talk about park ball, when you talk about um. When you, when you just talk about giving back to the community and creating a positive environments within the community, he has always represented that to New Orleans East. And um, when when I came in the game, when I first m- met Coach Buddy, I didn't I didn't know who he was. He was just the dude that used to be at the Nord meetings with the suits. He was the only <laughs> dude that was suits on. And I used to see him be like, man, this dude always have on suits. But I never knew what he did. I never knew who he was. I never even knew about you as a coach like that yeah, right yeah. it wasn't until after the pandemic where i really just did my research on you mm-hmm. like you've been new orleans east best kept secret for so long like everybody know you but the but not enough people know you in in, in my book you yeah, know what i'm saying yeah, like yeah. everybody know you but not a, more people should know you mm-hmm. and know what you b- represent to our community. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I really want to invite you here to really just let you um, explain like your background, like where you came from, um, and what what did you come from? Well, I'm uh, I'm originally from the Desire, man. Uh, Who Desire. I'm glad you didn't say Uptown. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I ain't no Uptown. I ain't got never lived Uptown. <laughs> You know, I know about Uptown, but uh, I'm straight, you know, nine wall ruler, you hear me? 3411 Florida Avenue, apartment D, you know, right up front. You know, grew up in a, in a desire and spent, uh, i say, the middle part of my life uh, in New Orleans East. You know, I'm basically from middle school, uh, well, actually from elementary on up to uh, my first years of high school, basically in the East. You know, attended uh, Ray Abrams, McDonald 40, uh, went to Livingston, then went to Abe. Um, now, while I was going to Abe, I was living, I had moved back in the desire because that's where my grandmother lived. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know how it is with your grandmothers. You know, you, yeah. you basically spend more time with your grandparents than, you know, back in the G right. than you did with your real parents. So I lived with my grandmother in the desire up until I was uh, in the fourth grade. Left fourth grade, went to the East, moved my mom and my dad. And, uh, what year was that? That had to be in like, uh, let me see, that was in 80, I believe it was in 86. 86. Yeah, 86. Cause how, I, how was the Desire Project in 86? Like, how, like, the Desire, the Desire was, it was, it was, it was, it was starting to get wild because, and I'll tell you why, you know, I'll tell you the crazy part about it. I was in a Desire when, before guns were introduced to New Orleans, like talking about it. Right. Everybody, you know, they had a few people that had guns. They had a little 38s. Right. But see, I was in a desire when the boys from the desire broke in the train. The train broke down. It was an army train. Broke down on the train tracks. Wow. And the boys from the desire broke in the train, stole all the guns off the train. You hear me? Wow. So the desire had all the power. Desire had all the guns. But this the thing. Desire started selling the guns. They started selling the uptown. You know, so I was there before, uh, really before crack hit. It was cocaine. I saw the transition between cocaine and and then going to crack. Like, man, I tell you, you know, just being a young boy in a desire, like everybody who we looked up to used to be sitting outside on the, um, on the cars. And they used to be hustling. Like the cars used to pull up, pull up in the middle of the driveway and everybody jump off the car and run up to the, uh, to the, to the same car. And had these rocks out in their hand, like, man, I got boulders bigger than your shoulders. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they used to say things like that. And, you know, I also saw where they started sending undercovers through. So one person would go up to the car, 
uh, the whole crowd would go up to the car and they'll recognize the undercover police come, you know, come through the damn, through the uh, courtyards and stuff in their cars. Everybody breaking out running. I saw a lot of people I looked up to go to jail, man. Um, you know, I've, I also, you know, in the desire, things used to happen where, man, uh, I remember if they wanted to hit, kill somebody, they would go shoot the lights out. They'll shoot the lights out. Lights be out in the whole project. So now they know where you at and they know where you at and they know where to find it. You can't hide. So I remember one night, man, the lights was out. They shot them out big, big time in the, in the back of the project. Had all the dude wind up getting killed that night because that's what they did. But, uh, man, the desire is original, bro. <laughs> I really be feeling like everybody uh, originated from the desire because the De desire was one of the first African-American projects. You know, Florida was white. Desire was black. St. Thomas was white. Wow. You know, Lafitte from the Sixth War was more of the, you know, um, Creoles. You know what I'm saying? Right. That's why you see that. So when you talk about African-Americans, you know, even the St. Bernard, you know what I'm saying? Um, most of these projects were originally for Caucasian or European-Americans. Right. And then after World War II, they started to move to suburbia or moving by their own houses. Right. And then we basically got their handmade house. But the Desire was created for us. Zaya was created created for African Americans. See, why you think why you think like we we when they talk about projects and like why you think a lot of times the desire don't get like that? They don't, they don't get talked about like that. Cause even 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 in the times of um the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the Black Panthers coming into the Desire Project and mm -hmm. teaching the kids martial arts and yeah. all these di these different things, right? Yeah. Why you think sometimes the, the, it, it get left behind so much? Like when when you talk about the help that they really need, like you you look at all the transformation that happened with the Magnolia Project, right? Yeah. And you see all the transformation that happened with the Calio Project and the Saint Bernard Project, and he did a little bit of transformation with the Desire Project, but not not on the security level that they did on the rest like you know like you don't see you don't see a lot of the the help coming to the night wall that you see well this is what the, this is this is this is the thing with the lafitte the saint bernard the saint thomas mm -hmm. the plan that they had for tearing down the projects and then putting homeowners do i guess uh what you call it uh mixed uh the mixed income mixed income environments or yeah. whatever it worked everywhere, but you got to realize the Desire was the very first project that they tore down. See, this is how my family got out of Desire. Probably we probably would have still been back there, but they tore the Desire down first. Wow! So when they tore the Desire down, and they, them being first, it was also the first project to be rebuilt. So when they orchestrated the plan, they put everybody who lived in a Desire after they closed it down, they put majority of them back into the same project. Right. Right. That's the difference between the Lafitte, the St. Bernard. Like, the St. Bernard have a whole bunch of NOPD living back there. Right. You mm -hmm. know, you got people that could buy their houses. It's basically like a little condo. Right. So you got a mixed income. But the desire is mostly just everybody who originally was from the project. Right. And that's what you see. That's the difference. Lafitte right. is a whole bunch of older people, people who probably could be homeowners. But they're buying it. They're buying that home and inside the Lafitte, right. you know, um, and that's the difference. I think I think just d d everything happened with the Desire before it's time, right. you know. Like that right. was the see, like when they closed the Desire, they pushed a lot of a lot of Desire to the east. I remember me living in Green Tree, right. whole, like almost the whole project. I ain't gonna say the whole project, but we had a whole bunch of people from the project living in Green Tree apartments. So um, a whole bunch of the Desire moved to the east, and then eventually, once they got the projects back open. Um, once they got the desire back open, you know, they took them. If they wanted to leave the St. Bernard, they come back to the desire. They did it, and they transitioned uh, a lot of the people back. So that's the biggest thing. Um, bro. Take me back. Take me back to Take me back to the time you first bought your son to a playground to play football. <laughs> Man, I tell you, uh <laughs> I remember the very first time. I'm, I, I'll tell you this: the very first time I brought my son to the playground, he was three, and I didn't bring him to Garetti. We went to Milne, right. and the reason why I brought him to Milne because my little cousin Skip, 
he brought my godson, his son, to Milton. So that's where he was playing at. Right. So I brought my son out there. My son wound up getting on the team, three years old. He said he wanted to play. I let him play. Then he started crying because he, want, he wanted to take the helmet off in the middle of the game. I told him he can't take it off. So he cried. And I said, we ain't coming back out here. You know, so uh, after that, you know, we wound up taking that y'all, brought him back out there when he was four years old, went to Garetti. And, uh, you know, being at Garetti, man, Garetti was the only playground that was open in the East at that time. And it was packed. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, every team had every bit of about 65, 70 kids on the team. You know, um, so my son was on the team and he was able to be on the team with other kids his age. So you had four year olds, five year olds, and six year olds. And we, tra- we we had two different teams. We had the black team and we had the gold team. So the black team was like really all the really good kids, all the six-year-olds, strong kids, fast, fast kids. But then you had the developmental team, which was the four- and five-year-olds, who basically were still learning. They were in the mm-hmm. learning process. But they were young, so they were still trying to learn. <laughs> and um, our first year, our team made it to the playoffs. We made it to the championship, the six-year-olds. And we wound up losing the, uh, to Milne. Lost the million like um within the last two minutes, man. It was crazy. So our six year olds lost. And uh once they lost, you know, now it was our time that next year we came back. You know, we we didn't win a game. The five year olds, we, we didn't win a game that first year, man. I, but we fought hard, you know. <laughs> and I remember us being out there, man. We had games we played, it was so muddy, and uh, the kids were, I mean, just full of mud helmets, jerseys, and they just built their pedigree. And you know the crazy thing about it is, is those kids that 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 fought in that mud right now, they going to college this year. Right. I'm but right. they dogged it out. They dogged it out. I'm talking about high school, man. They dogged it out. I'm talking about you know some of them, some of them in senior year now, like Michael Richard, you know Ryan Robs, a lot of them, uh, you know at Edna Cole, um, you know Tyrone, he's the, um the third, he's at uh, uh at McNeese State. A lot of these kids, um, you know, they really dogged it out, man. But we we lost because we were young. You even have kids, because I know this for a fact, you even have kids that you, like, there was the quiet kid mm-hmm. that, that didn't really stand out and all mm-hmm. like that, you know what I'm saying? They they, they kind of went under the radar. Yeah. Then they made, went to high school, went under the radar. Then, like, junior year, senior year, they popped out. Yeah. Right, they pop out, end up going to LSU. Yeah. And you and and they know you as mm-hmm. Coach Buddy. They remember you. Mm-hmm. You like, wait, who is this kid? Like, and you might look at their face and you remember their face. Yeah. You like, damn, dude, like you at LSU. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So it's not the kid that you could really name off the top of your head at the interviews because I know a kid and I don't know his name personally, but I just know him from Instagram. Mm-hmm. And his mom kept telling me that you coached him mm-hmm. and the kid he went to call and now he at LSU you yeah. know? and like I, I just can't remember the kid's name but it's, it's there, there are kids like that that it's like that yeah that's why I'm telling this is how deep Garetti was bro. right listen when you got 65 kids mm-hmm. you know how much talent you can filter out of those 65 kids and and I think that's one of the biggest things like Garetti kind of fed the whole East because um we started out with Garetta with 65 players on each team. But then, Digby need to get over. Right. So, like, our head coaches, like most of our head coaches, we had what? F- we had four teams, and I believe it was four head coaches left and went to Digby right. to go start up Digby program. So, with those coaches, you know, leaving, we so lost kids. kids. Yeah. Why? Because you had some kids that, you know, they were good. But they just can beat out the other kids that was that running back. But they 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 want to be a running back. Their parents want them to be a running back. So guess what? Those kids left, went to Dig B, got to start their running back. Now they leaders on the team. Now they going to high school and they dog. Now they in college, you know. And the same thing with other playgrounds like Kerry Curley, Joe Brown, you know, um, uh, Esho. All those pucks came from from Garetti. It's like Garetti is the foundation. And those coaches that left from there, they took kids from there and they brought them there. You know, so shouts out to the whole New Orleans East seven hundred one two E. You know, say, do how important do you feel like it is for all of these parks to have like 
representation within they, their neighborhoods. Like, 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 like you said, Goretti was like the only park that was open mm -hmm. at the time, right? Um, do you think we will ever see under a uh, African American urban um, us ruling of all of these parks, like like neighborhood wise, like open and running. You know what I'm saying? Because like yeah. you always have situations where you have Kenilworth popping, Goretti popping, Joe Brown popping, mm -hmm. and yeah, Prairie popping, Kenilworth not popping no more. And, like, do you think we'll ever see a day where you have all these parks like represented in their neighborhoods? Like, you don't have to have the kids from East Shore driving all the way to Goretti. And do you and, and do you feel like that's a good thing to have? Like. Like to have, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, like you said, Goretti was packed. The kids, the coaches, they went to Digby, and that started a a, a tradition mm -hmm. at Digby. Mm -hmm. it, like, do you feel like that's important for the East? I feel it's important. I do. I do think that every playground, well, every neighborhood needs its own playground back open. That's kind of how I came up. Mm -hmm. When I left from the Desire, you know, I was at Samson Park. I played for Coach Bobby Roy, seeing you know. And um, you know, that's basically the only park we had. Everybody from the Desire went and played at Samson, basically, you know, because we didn't have cars at that time. It was walking distance, that's what it was. But when I came to the east, every neighborhood had their own playground and a football team within it. Um it's important. And you see where we at <clears throat> without all of those parks and right. organizations. Yeah, it's important to have that but I think that I think that recreation the recreation department has to work hand in hand with with the school system that's one thing because you got to realize pe kids are getting up in the morning two hours before school start well they're getting up three hours but they're leaving their house maybe two hours before school start to catch a bus mm -hmm. to go all the way across town to school when there's a school that's maybe three blocks four blocks away from the house but the parents rather them go to the school because this other school is an A school and this school is an F school. Mm -hmm. See, there's a balance that we have to create. You know, every neighborhood has a mixture of smart people, people that's not so smart, right? Strong people, people that's not so strong. But what we're doing is we created a culture of strengthening a strong school, right? But then a weak school. I don't know if y'all noticed, but if y'all look at the letter grades on schools, you have A schools and then you have F schools. Mm -hmm. it, you, you have A schools, F schools, you may have Ds, but you don't have too it many. It ain't too many in between. It ain't too many in between, yeah. right? Because that's the reason why. The parents that want their kids to have good education and go to A schools, they're sending all the small, potentially small kids to the A schools. So the kids that, can go, that, that just go wherever they can, they're going to the F schools. Right? So you got weak schools and you got strong schools. Same thing like, look at Edna Coke. Look at Warren Easton. Same thing. Everybody, if you want your kid, they say if you want your kid to go to college, send them to Coke. Send them to Easton. This is why you have powerhouse schools. But then the schools like, you know, Abe Side Academy, you know, um, you know, McMain schools like that. You know, they look pretty at look at Nord. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Look, look at Nord. Like mm -hmm. you got Little bitty parks, mm -hmm. you got giant parks. Yeah, you there? Mm -hmm. No in between, and that's that's why um, a lot of times, and and this is where this is where me and you probably the only place me and you ever clash at, mm -hmm. right? And I know I know this a hot button issue with you, right? <laughs> so that's why I'm like, you see the grin. You <laughs> can't wait to get it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know it's a hot button issue with you, yeah. but I like to press those buttons. In, uh, in society mm -hmm. because somebody got to press them. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so the way I press them, I, I I might press them in an aggressive way, but I have, I have went on the record to say that, like, it's the, re the, the current environment that we're looking at is the fault of the people in the past, mm -hmm. right? Some of the coaches in the past, some of the... Political leaders in the past, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. fundamentally, and this is what we're getting. So even in the Bible, um, they 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 speak on we good on everything. Mm -hmm. All right, even in the Bible, they speak on um, 
they speak on the fact that hold on let me think about this right quick how i really want to structure this to you <laughs> i gotta think on how i really want to structure this to you they speak on the fact that the the people will be judged by their actions mm -hmm. and anything you see in the environment is based on those actions right so if you see like we come up under like your grandparents it wasn't not like you seen your grandparents do things that they said people couldn't do. Mm -hmm. They said white people, black people couldn't drink from that phone. Mm -hmm. No, we drank it from it. Like we, we gonna, they said black people couldn't do this. No, we doing, we doing everything they said we couldn't do. They said we couldn't go to the moon. We going to the moon. No, we going, we going to do everything they said we couldn't do. Right. And that's the generation they come from. And now we come from this, like Bernie Mac said, this punk ass parent generation where everybody copping out to their kids. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and, and and I feel like fundamentally in the past, um, they 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 had a well ain't nothing we could do about that situation going on. Well, the generation before that, oh, we could do something about that. Mm -hmm. You did like you not taking care of your kids, girl. Girl, I'm about to like grandma about to come in that bitch and regulate you. You know what I'm saying? Like no, like you gonna take care of these kids. Take that fucking crack out your fucking mouth, bitch. You think I'm about to let you sit around here? You know you come from like she gonna give you that. No, bitch, ain't no. You ain't getting no rest. You ain't no letting you smoke crack. Ain't no letting these kids sit in the house by themselves, not going to school. That's not happening. And once it came to oh, that's her kids, cause that's her section eight, and that's. Her kids, right? That used to be the Monroes. Oh, that's oh, that's the Monroe kids. Mm -hmm. Not oh, that's her kids. But because then the generation we take came care of. that was like, don't you tell my child nothing, right? But you got to think about it. All of that is a ripple effect of what we see now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So we have to get back to, and, and that's why I appreciate you so much because you represent fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And coming from five and six, you have to always work fundamental fundamental fundamentals yeah. and in life you work the same way yeah. so it's almost like a, a ripple effect in, in what i see in you so mm -hmm. we clash because you come from that generation mm -hmm. you did and you you really understand what it represent and me i just come from a a, a thing of saying that i do know what it represent mm -hmm. but we have to address what happened wrong too we mm -hmm. can't just say Oh, yeah, we did this right. Oh, we created hip hop. Oh, we did like, we got to say, oh, no, we let crack take over our community. We let ignorance take over our community. We let hate take over our community, too. Mm -hmm. You did? And this is how we address it. So I feel like, I feel like those parks represent something bigger. Because the park is the upper ripple effect of when the found when the foundation ain't right, then you're gonna see shit not right in high school. Then you're gonna mm -hmm. see shit not right in college. Now you're gonna see and what what Prime doing at Jackson State, he trying to start in the middle. You did like what Snoop was doing was starting at the foundation. Yeah. And he getting the parks back in Cali. You mm -hmm. did what Trick Daddy was doing was getting the parks back. But you don't see Birdman coming here getting the pugs back. You don't see we name Harrell Birdman. You like you know what I'm saying? Like you the one, and that's why I, I had to really invite you here because you the one that been in the East really manning, manning the ship, manning mm -hmm. the ship, mm -hmm. stand afloat, manning the ship, stand strong, supporting your teams, supporting the environment. But at the same time, they they let a lot of shit go. You know what I'm saying? And even though you was one that man the ship, if more people would have got behind a person like you and fought that fight for real and stood on that, we would be in a way better place. You know what I'm saying? Like fundamentally, because it start at the parks, because that's where the parents learn how to commute. Like, like that's where we pray. Yeah. My, I, I told my son today, bro, on the way from all the way from practice, I said, look, by me working two jobs, I don't really get to see them that much. They either sleep. Or just going to sleep, or I'm leaving five o'clock in the morning, they sleep. I'm getting off 11, 12 o'clock at night, they sleep, right? So I told him, I said, Look, don't forget to pray before y'all go to sleep. And Bradley was like, Pray? Why, why I gotta pray? I said, You pray because prayer is like your bank. Like, like when you have a bank account and you have money in it, like you don't just come to God when 
times hard, you build that relationship with God. You talk to him and ask him to show you things in your life and reveal himself in your life right. during your life so you could build that relationship. So when times get hard and you don't know what to do, you could turn to that bank and say, oh, I got this money in this account. Oh, God, please, God. Like, and, and Bradley said, well, I had a time like that. He said, when I was at Bulldogs practice and they started shooting, and everybody said, and you know, I think he said, Coach Buddy, or Coach somebody, they had another coach, they were standing by, he said, he was like, everybody get down, lay on the ground. He said, and I was scared, and I didn't know what to do. I said, did you pray? He said, no. He said, I just got down on the ground. I said, see, because you, because I didn't teach you. You know what I'm saying? That's why I'm teaching you to build this relationship with God because you're going to need it in life because you're going to come to times where you ain't going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. And that's when that prayer kick in. And I explained that to him just because he put me on the spot. Right, but that was a question I asked God three, four days ago. I'm like, I don't even know why I like why I pray. Like, I don't, I don't pray that much, but mm. I talk to God in my head. Like, I talk to Him and ask Him to reveal things, but I don't ever pray. And I'll be like, I gotta pray. <laughs> you did, but prayer is a form of submission. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a form, and I just learned that because I had to tell my child something. And it just came to me, you know what I'm saying? That's God, that's God breathed, though. That's yeah. God speaking through you to your son, man. Right. That's how that is. But I learned a lot of that from you, cause like you, you really, you really, a, you, you're a football coach, but you speak like a pastor. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you. That's my ministry. Right, right, right. I had, you know, man. Look, I used to, um, I'm sorry, yeah. I used to miss a a lot of church, and uh, my pastor be like, "You out there coaching them boys, huh?" <laughs> and that's why I said, "That's my ministry." You know. That's why you know my pastor. He has his church and his congregation. Well, that's my ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, I deal with the youth, and uh, it's it's extremely important to have a, a a relationship with God. You know, and what you're talking about, you're speaking about the connection. Like you never want to lose your connection. You know, and I mean, don't get me wrong. We all, you know, we fall short of the glory. You know, fall by the wayside, and we may lose our connection, but. What you're speaking of, a praying and keeping that relationship with God, you know, um, is extremely important. You know, like, um, can't know anybody go and ask God for anything. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you don't have favor, and that's why when you hear pe older people talking about, I got favor, you know, God's grace, God's mercy, you know, um, these things are extremely important. And this is how you gain that. You know, it's about... God knowing who you are. Think about it. You don't pray to him, and then you go to pray, and you, you asking God, but man, who this is? <laughs> who this is? <laughs> you know? Um, so that's why it's extremely important, man. But uh, my pastor always preach on, he always speaks on uh, on mercy. And he said, uh, mercy is God not giving you what you do deserve. Mm -hmm. I did the crime, but I didn't do the time. Mm -hmm. You got me? Man, uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's that's something big, and it means something. He said, man, I was guilty. They watched me do this crime. But God said, I, 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 I. Jesus said, I died for that. I died for that. Mm -hmm. He good. He off the hook. And that's what I like, man. So it's, it's important to teach our kids to have a, a great relationship with God, you know? so Man, Coach Buddy, name, talk about some of these other coaches in know that you that that you came up admiring because I come in the game with my kid. Um I come up under Coach Apple, right? Mm -hmm. And um my story with Coach Apple kind of started where I was bringing my kid to Easton because uh, his mom cousin was coaching there, mm -hmm. right? So we bring him out to Easton and I ended up meeting Coach Apple which New Orleans is a big small city. Yeah. Well, once you meet somebody you, f you find out, "Oh, all right, that's we family already." You know what I'm saying? So he coached Bryce, and he taught Bryce his fundamentals. And, and Braden was a little baby, and he was able to teach Braden some of his fundamentals. We met a coach Romeo who come up under them, yeah. uh, crazy Romeo, you yeah, there. And so like, um, Man, Romeo committed. I love Romeo, bro. <laughs> so he come up under Apple too. You know what I'm saying? So, but like, um, talk about some of the coaches that we might not know that you kind of look up to or come up with that's you know that don't get some of the to talk about that we should know? Well, you know, the coaches that I really came up under, you know, everybody know. I won't lie to you, bro. It, everybody know the coaches I got. You know, one, you know Coach Marvin Kelly Sr., you know, that's the goat there. You know, he basically spoon-fed me a lot of this stuff that I do. 
And um, a lot of the ways I approach my team and approach my the kids and game planning is is a lot of the things that he instilled into me. You know, rest in peace, Coach Marv. You know, um, he taught me a whole lot. But other other coaches that I I lean on outside of North when I'm talking about this mentorship. Being my mentor, def- definitely Coach Derek, that's like my big brother. You know, Derek Henderson at Rail. You know, uh, Coach Johnny White at Willie Hall. You know, these guys been doing this for a long time. But, you know, some of the coaches I would say uh, that's not doing anything, Coach Wayne, you know, from um, from Pontchartrain, currently over at, uh, at MLK. You know, Coach Ray. You know, Coach Odie. You know, Coach Odie is one of the most passionate. I love Coach Odie with everything in me, you know. That's a really, 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 really good coach, you know. Um, but we got a lot of great coaches out there, man. You know, definitely Coach Coach Bobby Roy Sr. You know, this guy was like everything to us in the desire. <laughs> I'm talking about he would coach every team, man. That's just what it was. And he would feed us and do everything else he needed to do us over at Samson, man. So, Wow. Bro, like when I got introduced to Nord, it was the best and worst thing to ever happen to me. Yeah. Like, it was the best thing because me being the type of person I am, I, I, I was able to, like, affect my community in a positive way. Yeah. It was the worst thing because it was like the Spider-Man syndrome. You did with great power comes great responsibility. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and And... You see people do things that clash with your morals. You know what I'm saying? And you got to speak up on it or you got to. And um, why do you think youth sports become so combative? And, and I'm only speaking that because out, out of the week of what happened in Texas, if, if, if people watching this don't know, um, a youth. That a youth sport scrimmage, not even a real season game. It was a scrimmage, and an NFL football player's brother got into an altercation with a coach and shot the coach. You know what I'm saying? Like, and this is Texas. Like, we we all look at Texas as the pinnacle for youth sports, the pinnacle for a lot of sports. On because Louisiana, we have all the dogs, mm-hmm. we have all the raw talent, but Texas really have the environment. That that really like make you your best, yeah. Like they got mm. the organization. It's right. kind of like Rocky, Rocky Fool, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Know? Right. Right. So what? you 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 have you have this situation going on in Texas, and you know we have situ. You you've been in you you've been in North in this New Orleans. This is, is like the one of the cities that we don't take no mess, right? So you know how you sports could get like like. Do you think like? Is there a place for that in youth sports? Like, why why you think that happened? Like, well, I think for the most part, a lot of people are in it for the wrong reason, right? This is recreation, right? Something for your kids to do. Man, yeah. Listen, the root word of recreation is recreate. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, the whole objective of this is to change the narrative or change the uh, the outcome of potentially having hazardous. Um, has this come happening in your community, right? Um, like in, in in Chicago, you know, a lot of families speak on subcultures such as gangs, such as different things that they become, uh, that kids can become a part of. Mm-hmm. Well, this recreation is something that's that's curve that's there to curve kids from not going in that direction. Mm-hmm. This is something that gives your kids the opportunity to do something positive versus getting getting caught up in something that's negative. Now, this is the biggest problem that's going on in youth sports. Um, a lot of people have jumped off the sofa from put the put the Madden control sticks down and they come out there and they want to play this game through real lives. These are real lives. These kids are going to grow up and be something. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And the biggest problem that they have is that people really bet on these games. On the kids' games? They bet on these kids' games. Wow. Just like they're betting on Madden. I'm talking about, like, realistically. Right. Just like they're betting on, like, they play the Madden game. Yeah, man, I bet you $100, you know? So then they go from, okay, I can make this this team beat you on Madden. Now I'm in the park trying to coach. I don't have no people skills. I don't have no leadership skills. I have no patience. 
I know what the players look like on the screen. Right. So I'm gonna get these kids, and that's why you see that some people, uh, some kids, like you see little six and seven year teams trying to run offenses that twelve year olds mm-hmm. run, right? Right. Because they're taking this stuff straight off mat. They don't right. understand that there's a level. You know, these kids have to process this and uh and execute it. You know, but that's the biggest problem, bro. The biggest problem is a lot of people are in this for the wrong reason. You know, and it's a shame because uh, we're mentors. Right. You know, like, you know, I mean, you talked about this a while ago. I said that um, winning is a reward. It's an additive. Right. You know, it may happen. You know what I'm saying? But ultimately, it's about the lessons. Right. You know, it's ultimately about, you know, how we teach kids to deal with winning and how we teach them to deal with adversity, adversity and losing. No, that's extremely important that we teach kids that hard work pays off. Right. Mm-hmm. And that even though we work real hard and it don't go our way, that everything ain't going to go our way sometime. But don't but never. You try it. You try it and don't never give up. No, right. that's funny because I, I just, I just, oh, this, all this, all this is so funny because I just got finished telling my two older kids. It was like, um, they're like, what, where Bradley going to go? Um, as the coach buddy, right? <laughs> I said, I said, well, it depends. I said, Bradley gonna play for Buddy as long as Buddy coach. And then I said, Buddy decide to pull a um, pull pull off like the rest of the, like some of these other coaches and follow him in the high school. You know what I mean? <laughs> He'll just be playing for Buddy for the rest of his life. I said, for the simple fact, he don't play for Buddy to win. It's like I'm not sending him to Buddy because. They gonna win Buku games. They're like they might win Buku games, but that's not why he he heat up. You know what I'm saying? Like he gonna get, he gonna really get. Life lesson. Yeah, he gonna really get to be around strong people. You know what I'm saying? And 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 see and see what that is outside of me because I feel like it's important. And me and Courtney always talk about this: how important it is for kids to see different men. The different strong men from different walks of life, they have right. different ideas and different, different fundamentals. Stories, yeah. That's all positive and all coming from God, too. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And the park is so good because that's where you get that from. You that's see dads get. with nursing uniforms, dads with construction uniforms, dads with cooking shirts on, dads with bands. You know what I'm saying? Like, you see all type of different dads out here. People who not even dads. People that's out here with their nephews and all type of different situations you see just coming into the whole, just trying to make a season happen. Um, I feel like we should be able to do that for a lot of different things. I feel like the park is the start of that. And that's why I raise such a fuss sometimes. And that's why we fuss so much because I attack them dudes because I feel like they have the power to do it. And I'm trying to get the power to do that. You know what I'm saying? And I don't appreciate when they kind of step on my toes. And I'm like, all right, look, if you if you don't believe in it, cool. When you step on my toes, you become the op. You know what I'm saying? I gotta and I gotta poke. I gotta poke at you. I can't really fight with you because I love you so much. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I gotta poke you. I got to because I love you so much. You know what I'm saying? Like I gotta. I'm. I'm I, I'm tr- I, I will never just go public and just be like da 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 da, da, da whatever. But I will poke you on some on Nola you shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I'm going to poke at you in our little group chats yeah. and all that. Yeah. I'm going to say something. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Outside of that, we're going to smile and be friends. But, bitch, when it's me and you, I'm going to be like, you know you're a bitch-ass nigga for all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's where I'm at. But, mm-hmm. like, do you feel... What's your, what's your, what your what you feel like your future is? Like, with, with you doing this so long, right? Like... You see, you see, Coach Derek, he keep retiring and retiring, and you're like he 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 gonna always be within somewhere in the game, yeah. even if he not coaching a team, he gonna be in a concession stand, he gonna be throwing um, Mardi Gras classics or whatever, he gonna be in the game. What you do? You feel like you'll ever just get us up? Well, before before I get to that, All right. I, I look, All I right. want I want to send a shout out to Coach Derek. You know, Coach Derek been under the weather, man. Been in the hospital. Oh, man. Yeah, man. The last uh, probably I think uh, over a week now. You know, wow. from what I understand, he uh, dealing with some uh, some bronchitis issues. You know, uh-huh. something like COVID. Yeah. 
Right. So definitely, Coach Derek, man, we love you. We praying for you, man. You know, Harrell University, man, y'all keep holding my bro up, man. Uh, we it's definitely love you, bro. Prayers. So, uh, you know, I try to reach out to you. So I'm going to definitely come pull up on you. Mitch was supposed to send me information so I can come to the uh, hospital and sing you some flowers. But, you know, definitely praying for you, man. But um, as far as me, bro, I ain't going to lie. I be trying to retire every year. <laughs> I've been trying to retire every year for the last, like, uh, I said, that year when the pan that was 2020 mm -hmm. pandemic. So I've been the last two years. I was trying. I was trying to retire. I was already set to retire. And, you know, I had smash. I had Coach J. He was gonna take over the five and six. Right. Um, but Coach J. wound up cutting coach the five and six because he wound up getting another job. Right. So I had to come coach the uh, five and six year olds at the last minute. That was right. the pandemic COVID year. Right. And did that. So once I coached that year, I now, you know, I coached the six-year-old, but then I had five-year-olds right. that I had to coach. I was like, man, I got to coach these little five-year-olds because this, this is my little babies. I got to right. get them out the way, right. you know. Now, the thing that made it so convenient from 2019 was Coach Smash coached the five-year-old team. So he had, you know, he had Sean Fernet, he had Kenzo, he had all them right. on the itty-bitty team. So it was easy. It was like they knew him already. They knew me, but they spent more time with him. Right. So I was like, well, you know what? They're coming up to six years old. He can have them. I can retire and I'm good. My son is in high school at Warren Easton. Mm -hmm. I can go out there. Fairy tale. Fairy tale. Yeah, yeah man. Fairy. But it didn't work out that way, bro. Because it was destined for him to coach my son. Right. I'm telling you, like, destiny stepped in for that group, dog. Because Coach Selfish. Buddy was out of it. You know what I mean? He was out of it. Yeah, my I was son gone. I never knew who Coach Buddy was if if the sands of time with the, you know what I mean? So, yeah. all right, so speak on it. Like, yeah. you there. You. Yeah, so I wind up, I wind up, uh, I coached the six year olds that COVID year that was supposed to be Coach J, Coach Smash team. Right. And then, uh, so I was supposed, so that next year, I had to come back because, like I said, I had, I had my little five year old. Right. Right. <laughs> that was the team that just went up. Um, that was Ken and and uh, you know, Fatty and all them. Right. So I wind up having to coach them. So I wind up coaching them. Now this year, you know, uh I left the babies. Now I'm coaching seven and eight. So right. I done follow Fatty and Ken and all them up there on that seven and eight year old team. But, you know, it's a blessing to be a part of uh be a part of these kids' lives, you know, and, and to see them grow up to be young men, right? you know, mm -hmm. and then come back and, you know, and just, you know, acknowledge and say, hey, Coach Buddy, this is how I'm doing. <laughs> I love to see them do well once they get older. I've had some kids that have, uh, you know, they've went in the wrong direction, you know. It's not a whole lot of them because we have really good parents and we got a, a really good a good family system at, at Goretti. Right. You know, and I think that's one of the most important things that it takes for these kids to be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, like at Goretta, you're going to see where not only the mama going to be out there, but you're going to see the grandma, the grandpa, the auntie, the, the nanan, the yeah. cousins, everybody out there. Like when they come out there, and that not only happens at Goretti, but you see that same system throughout their whole life. Right. Like these kids go when they leave already, now they're going into high school. Ninth grade, they probably ain't even starting. But their whole family is in the stands with a t shirt on, <laughs> representing them. Right. And 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 that's important because it takes a village. Right. We we say it takes a village to raise a child. And that's that village, man. You know, it takes that that entire circumference of that family to be there. Right. And let that kid know that he's important. That's how them kids make it to college. Mm -hmm. That's how them kids make it to the pros. Because they know they got a whole village behind them. Now, don't get me wrong. I ain't saying that a kid with his one mama being at every game for him don't mean nothing. Right. I'm just telling you that that village mentality is one of the things that push these kids to be more successful. Mm -hmm. And it takes that. Where we at on the sign? 18 minutes. 18 minutes. This 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 is something I really wanted to ask you, Coach. Mm -hmm. Um, can you speak on your first time meeting uh, um Kuhan Davis? Oh, Cody, man. All right, so listen, this is this is the thing. This is what happened with Kuhan, right? When Kohan came to Goretti, when he was five, I was coaching the nine and ten year old team. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what happened was we had just won a championship in 2015. Mm -hmm. That was with Jay and Terrence, um, Jace, 
uh, Chubby and all them. We mm-hmm. had just won, won the championship with 2015. So we had a vacancy um, at, uh, let me see, was it 11 and 12? Yeah, it was 11 and 12. Um, because Coach Duke, Leonard, Leonard went to, he went to LSU. Leonard right. was going to LSU. Right. So Leonard was going to uh, LSU. Coach Duke was the 11 and 12 coach. Co- coach Duke had to lead 11 and 12 because he wanted to be at Leonard games on Saturdays, right? right? So Coach Anthony <laughs> was the 9 and 10 coach. Coach, <laughs> and coach Anthony, we made a decision. Coach Anthony was going to go up to 11 and 12. I was going to leapfrog from 5 and 6, and I went to 9 and 10. And Coach Marvin Jr., Marvin Kellen Jr., was going to re- Coach position at five and six. Right. So that's what that's how that went. And uh, so Coach Marv was Cohine first head coach. All right. And you know he man, look, let me tell you, I was down. You know, it's kind of, you know, when you on the park, it's hard to see other kids. But when you dealing with your team, right. But like Cohine was a kid that the whole his name was ringing throughout the park. Right. Because he had a little, you know, he had a little, a little, you know, a little catchy name, Cohine the Barbarian. Right. You know, and the little kid was five, but the little kid was scoring a whole bunch of touchdowns. Him and the little kid, Jaden, JJ. JJ was the man on the team that year. Right. But Kohan was five, and he was running the ball. So um, we we wound up having a good little season that year. Didn't make it to the playoffs, but we had a good year. Right. So I went back down to five and six that next year because Coach Marvin had some, uh, some little health issues he had to deal with. So I went back down to Novice and Coach Kohan. So man, when I really got to see him at six years old, I was like, man, this little kid here, he looked like like a a real damn NFL player, a little baby NFL player. <laughs> and then um, we lined him up. You know, we did a lot of running. I saw he was fast. I saw he was physical. But you know, that don't mean nothing. Right. I need to see what he gonna do when he get them pads. Right. Man, when we got them pads, I couldn't send nobody against him. Everybody I sent sent him uh, against Kohan, he was laying them out. <laughs> the only person that helped me out that year with Kohan was when JL came. Wow. JL came like the week before the season started. His mama brought him out there. She was like, "Hey, coach, buddy, JL coming back? You know he played last year." Right. So when JL got in pass, I sent them against Kohan. Ah, they cracked. I said, "Oh, I said, all right now. I got somebody that can they can go against uh, go against Kohan." So I wound up putting him in the backfield. Kohan is a very Respectable young man, very talented, very smart, right? Now, when I say talented, though, you know how much stuff this dude do? Back right? to the, the Kohan Davis was yeah. speaking on. Um, you're going to be able to edit all that, right? Mm-hmm. All right, cool. You remember where you was at on the yeah, Kohan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I finished. think, you know, Kohan is, uh, this little kid is so talented. He not only plays football, but he plays baseball and plays that at a high level. Basketball, high level. Marches in a band. You know, uh, he used to be in karate when he was small, you know, and, um, you know, I know a lot about him, come from a really good family, you know, uh, mom and brother, some of his biggest supporters, you know, shout out to his brother, Papa, you know, he in college just started uh, this week. Great kid. So, yeah, really Mm -hmm. good kid, man. But, you know, most importantly, the way his mom goes out the way for both of them, you know, their mom works, works, works. But she never miss practice, mm-hmm. and she pick up other kids and bring them there, you know. And she be on them with their grades, and she make sure that he's at everything that he's committed to. Like go ahead and start nothing and quit it. Anything he start, he got to finish, finish it. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is, and that's morals and values that she's instilling into him. I have no doubt in my mind that this kid is gonna go as far as he want to go. If he want to go to NFL, he gonna go to NFL. That's just what it is, um, because of. Because of the way he built, already. yeah. Y'all, I mean, this this little boy' middle name is Warrior. Mm. Like, you know, I learned what during travel ball. You know, I brought him, I brought him on the road, mm. and uh, you know, I had his birth certificate, and so we basically, I'm looking. His name is Kohan Warrior Davis. Mm. That just lets you know how he built in his pedigree, right? Right there, you know. So I love that little kid. Really good kid. You know, real respectable, a little playful. He's a kid, Great. you know, but definitely a really good kid, you know. And I, I talked to him today, and he's like, what's up, Coach Buddy? Voice getting deep. I'm like, damn, this boy, damn Warrior. that grown That's man. man. <laughs> and, and the reason why I bring up a Kohan, because when I asked this question universally, I asked, um, 
what I asked people, I said, what's the closest kid you ever seen to um like a Leonard Fournette? Mm-hmm. Or something like that. Cause it was the, everybody that tell me about North football tell me that Leonard Fournette was the greatest thing they ever seen in North football. Oh, yeah. So I asked the question in this generation, like what's the greatest kid that you seen like perform in North that remind you of Leonard Fournette and he always bring up Kuhan Davis. And and the greatest game I ever I ever even witnessed um, in North football was I think that was last year, right, for the championship for nine and ten. Oh yeah, yeah. And that kid is, is on my YouTube page. And how he is? He was nine and he was on nine, he, he was on nine and ten that year. He him and and JL JL mm-hmm. JL, and and I want to ask you about that too about that relationship and how did that form because you you told me about the clash and JL was the only person after that. Him and JL just created that bond, right? Or, yeah, uh, yeah. Him, and, he and JL. You, you got to realize, like a lot of these kids form bonds, not based upon what they do. It's more about the parents. You know what I'm saying? Like when the parents got a relationship, think about it. If you got a good relationship with somebody, you bring your kids. Your kids play together. They form a relationship. Right. That's usually how it is. So, um, you know, with JL, by them playing together, being two captains, being in the middle. Both of them running backs, you know, they spent a whole bunch of time. You know, I used to bring them to my house. Uh, well, their parents used to drop them off at my house on weekends mm-hmm. because we would practice in the backyard. And they would get get everything down packed. Um, they would know how to get the ball, put them on cones, uh, learn those little small things, little technical things that was going to give them the edge on how we could win. Um, but JL and Kohan basically being teammates, Parents always together is what born what uh, form their bond, you know. Um, but JL, it's another one. Like that kid is gonna go as far as he wants to go, you know. In my eyesight, I think he's the best quarterback at his age level in the entire country. Bro, bro, JL, JL, um, court, coach Cole Courtney, um, ten oh eight TV Courtney, he called JL poetry in motion. Mm-hmm. And um, when and me being a cameraman, mm-hmm. right, I, I get to look at the footage in slow motion and slow it down and look at certain things. Man, this kid have the best hips I ever seen on a youth football player. Like, and and I've been recording for a minute, right? And I've been looking at kids. Uh, Kyle was another one who have good hips. Kyle mm-hmm. from Saint Rock, yeah, great hips. Like they do this thing with their hips where they can like shift. And make a p- person commit and then shift back and make you know what I'm saying, make you look crazy. And they do this little wiggle with their hips. So they wait for you to commit. You're there and they, and they just w- like they wiggling. On, like when you look at it in slow motion, mm-hmm. it's a wiggle. Yeah. You're there like, and, and I'm like, this little motherfucker here just <laughs> like, he just creep. And and, 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 and I'm watching, and I'm watching Coach Nick call a play and he's like, whatever the play is, whatever, whatever, whatever. JL, look at Nick, smile, go run whatever the fuck he want to run. He didn't he didn't look that cool high and they didn't change the whole play around, mm-hmm. right? Run a touchdown. Nick like, what the fuck was that? Mm-hmm. A touchdown, nigga. That's what the fuck it was. <laughs> yeah, you know, like <laughs> JL is so strong. Like this kid then became so strong. And he he's become so fast. Right. JL, like, let me tell you, Kohan used to win all the gold medals for track. Right. Right? Kawhi used to win them. Oh, yeah, we had PJ. PJ, he had a good birthday for track. Right. But it was PJ, then it was Kohan, then it was JL. Right. But then, you know, Q Rich came. Right. Q Rich, Q Rich blew up. He blew, Look, right. Q Rich was the fastest one at, I think that was the 10 year old year, if right. I'm not mistaken. Man, JL come back, and he's faster than, than everybody else. He's getting taller, he's getting stronger. And, you know, like I say, Mom, committed. mom, dad, they got him, they're bringing him to training. He working out. You can see his muscles coming. You can see his abs. All that stuff play a role. Him right. and Kohan, I'm proud. That's a, I'm proud. Great work, man. That's some great work. And it, it didn't just start, you know, like I said, it started with me, but it's the parents, it's the coaches, Coach Nick, constantly investing time into him, bro. Right. You know, God is good, man. I ain't going right. to lie to you. God is good. Right. I think, I think we, was, we were even blessed to see a lot of these kids that play this Noah game. Cause they really play their hearts out. They really you watch them develop. You watch them develop into um, 
not just football players they they get life lessons and develop them relationships and um and one thing i learned just being around the youth game period is the value of relationships like relationships are worth more than money and when you're a part of these different parks and fraternities that that we all create within our urban spaces right mm -hmm. um those relationships are worth a lot and in in our current environment that we have that's so volatile um it put a it put all of those relationships in jeopardy you know what i'm saying because if 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 your kid wilding out with guns and shoot my kid or another kid that's putting like me and you can't be friends like like we can but it depends on your attitude like you can't be condoning what your son did and we friends yeah. We we not gonna be friends if you could donate your son home and my son. Right. We not fr we could never be friends. Mm -hmm. And and we can't get money together. We can't. So that's why you see a lot of our own communities in shambles. I think New Orleans is a place that's like I said, is a, a small big city, right? Yeah. And if we can fix it here, right, it's it's gonna be already fixed in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Like if we could fix it on on in this little laboratory that we have because we have all the big city things, but we have the small city relationships. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I feel like if we could fix it here and it start with people like you, it start with um like the the great guys that's out here giving their time back on the on the ground level. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I feel like if we could fix it there I, I really have great hopes for the city, bro. Like uh, people people look at me like I'm crazy when I say that like I could see I can envision um, New Orleans East being a black Mecca, being a, like black Harlem back in the days. Like I could envision that and see that and feel it and know that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I know that the Bible speak on things, everything being peaceful at a time before the, the before the judgment. You know what I'm saying? Like we're going to have a time when we get it together. But I feel like it started with us. I feel mm -hmm. like we the most important pieces. And people knowing who you are and what you do and what you bring to the table mm -hmm. hopefully will bring more attention to that aspect of New Orleans East because we're a big part of what it means to be black in America. Well, yeah. Well, District E is the, the largest district in the whole city of New Orleans. Mm -hmm. The largest. No nothing. You got to realize that New Orleans East is huge. You don't get homes outside of New Orleans East, like nowhere in New Orleans. We the ones with the big backyards. And it was because this wasn't really an African-American community prior to, mm -hmm. I'm not going to say uh, as much as Katrina. Um, I would say um, when the Desire closed down, back to that. When they started to move people from the Desire to the East, then a lot of European-Americans started to move away from the east and migrate to the yeah, north shore. They went to Covington. They went to Slidell, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and that's what that was. So you got to realize the Plaza had Chick-fil-A, you know? The Plaza had a skating ring. I mean, ice skating ring. The Plaza right. had everything. You know? So you're talking about this was, this was a community built around, I would say, its demographic that was currently there. But as everything transitioned, like if you look at New Orleans East the way it was, Prior to the the nineties, New Orleans East was thriving. was was thriving. You know, you had several different shopping centers. You know, big time, big time. So what you say is, it's 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 kind of, it's, it's right. I agree with you. We are the most important piece. But the thing is, I don't think we had the financial resources. I think we have the power. We have the strength to do it. Mm -hmm. But financially, you got to realize. The thing that's making the biggest impact on our community is is this, right? Mm -hmm. It's the TV, it's the radio, it's the, the laptops and the computers, you know? Um, because even I'm on here, I'm on this podcast, mm -hmm. I'm in this phone. If I wasn't on this podcast, I'd be in my phone right now. I pay more attention to that than almost anything. But I think the powerful thing about the phone mm -hmm. is... Uh, because everything is a tool, mm -hmm. all right? So um, whether you're using a gun to start a race or mm -hmm. using a gun to clear up a, a fight, or that's a different, that's a peaceful way you use a gun. You use a gun to defend children, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, to defend your countryside, your like the, a defensive, and then you have harmful ways you use guns. 
I feel like the I, I feel like a lot of the communicative devices and 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 and, and this is something else I want to bring up before we even wrap up everything. Um, the fact that how you brought up about um Chicago, I wanted to say how the people in Chicago left Chicago and brought that shit with them. How uh, when the hurricane hit, the people from New Orleans they brought that shit with them. So it's the people, it's not the the city. You know what I'm saying? It's the people that's bringing that bullshit with them to these all these different places mm-hmm. that 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 really kill the communication and relationship. So we can never be financially like, even though Coach Buddy might have a lot of money, uh, Keenan might have a lot of money, Coach Benjamin might have a whole lot of money, right? If we don't have the relationship, the money don't even matter. Like we can all be billionaires. Mm-hmm. If we don't have the relationship, the money don't matter. That's true. Right. And so the these devices can either destroy that relationship or, or build, build it. It depends on how we decide to for this thing to to affect our lives. Like I've been doing media for a long time. I've been in some volatile situations. I've been in situations where I had to I had to step in and stop people from being murdered. Mm-hmm. Stop just on my just acts. You know what I'm saying on my behalf because I really got love for this person. I know that they're not really a bad person that deserved this. You know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. because I see it coming. Uh, t- speak to that person and tell them, look, go apologize to this dude, dog, because. Unless you want, you know what I'm saying, shit to get serious. So I put myself in those situations where I had to put my relationship on the line mm-hmm. to, you know what I'm saying, to to stop harm from happening. And I, I just feel like the mending of those relationships start with us and using these and choosing to use these devices and tune out a lot of the bullshit. So I want to, I want to, I want to kind of interject on what you were saying like okay so the thing is right the gun could you it could be used as a defense to protect ourselves could be used as, uh to protect the countryside it could be used to start a race like you said but what's being displayed and where is it being displayed when when the use of a gun to the kids right so on the video game what are the kids doing with the gun are they starting uh, no right in some pl- some cases they are defending their countryside they're in the military mm-hmm. they're killing zombies mm-hmm. right but you gotta realize what's being filtered to the kids. But then yeah. in the radio, We've been on that for the past couple of weeks. Yeah. So what about the radio? What, like what the radio? What the radio telling our kids when they listen to the music? What is it saying? Right? It's telling, oh yeah, I did this to that one. I put him down. And I My did heart. that. So it, 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 so I remember growing up in the '80s. Right. Mm-hmm. This is where TV used to go off at night. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And after the show would end at night, it would say, "All right." Or after after a show would go off and say back to your regularly scheduled regular regularly scheduled program. Right. That's what these things are for. Right. They are programs. Mm-hmm. They program us. Right. You got to realize, and I'll tell you one thing that I, I'm, I'm proud about <laughs> is in the uh, in the late '80s when uh, when uh, Bill Bill Cosby came out with a different world mm-hmm. that sparked the largest growth of African Americans attending college. college. Right. In the entire entirety of time with African Americans, now, not granted, there's a lot of things that was working with that. Like in the uh, in the late '80s, you had um, Reverend Jesse Jackson. He started Operation Push, right, which was uh, governed to make sure that African Americans had the opportunities to go to college and things mm-hmm. like that. Right. So it's a lot of things that work together. So, but when they saw that, got to realize when they saw that Dr. Huxtable, right, got to kill this shit. Like, so what they did. All right, well, guess what? We're going to take this, but now we're going to give them gangster rap. You remember Rock? I remember Rock. Rock, yeah. Rock, Rock was a garbage, garbage man. man. Yeah. His, his wife made more money than him, and he was still the man of his he house. He was the man of his He's house. the man of his house. They got rid of that ASAP. But let me tell you, I'm going to tell you where I'm gonna tell you where our community got out of spiral. We like, cocaine didn't affect us. Like, you know, that wasn't our drug. Yeah, we had, it was selling coke, but it, it, ain't nothing that, it yeah. wasn't nothing that was, was doing anything like that where it had us killing each other like that. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Like in 85, 86, we wasn't, we wasn't no murder capital. If you look at New Orleans debts, I man, I, I swear that it amazed me. I went back all the way to the, list that to came the 19th. Out. Yeah, right. right. That and like, list. we was having like 47 debts. Wow. 47. Like in 85, you probably had like, probably like 40 debts. Right, but if you look at eighty nine and then went to ninety two, that's when the death start going into the hundreds, hundreds and two hundred. And the reason why is you got to look at how gangster rap sparked everything. See, when New York had the helm, right? right? New York was more about 
you, you, you know, you had BDP. You know, you had these people, they, 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 they're speaking on growth. You know what I'm saying? They're talking, putting us on game, right? But then they said, we're going to give these Negroes gangster rap. We're going to get them NWA. Right. They, they drove a wedge, you know, like, fuck the police. And what, what everybody was yelling. Fuck the, Fuck the police. police. We were throwing rocks at him. And then they were talking about when Easy was talking about he got he's slinging his rocks. Get what everybody else start doing. Slinging rocks. Because this is the thing. We've always been about 10 years behind Cali. Right. But that bridged the gap. Because when they allowed their their voices to be heard on that radio, on that tape, now we can do it right then and there. And now the gap even more bridge. Like the gap, not even a gap no more. It's not a gap. That bridge is like we <laughs> just connected. Yeah. Like nobody don't even have their own slings. Everybody <laughs> speak like everybody. Everybody. And and I'm, you know the trip part is New Orleans slang, New Orleans slang is the slang that's being used around the whole world. This, the things that we originate here is being imputed around the whole world. And that's and that's why I get back to when we, I feel like when we build that fundamental structure here, mm -hmm. like we can, because we still, we still have a lot of those relationships that's there. It's just that they're unraveling mm -hmm. every day. They're unraveling more and more throughout the years, but they're still there because we still locked in. So I feel like, I feel like once we get it, I feel like they're going to get it like on, on a fundamental level, bro. Like, I, but listen, this is the thing. I think that we so far behind. I think we so way off. I think we way. I know where you want to be, but let's think about the egos that we got going within small football playgrounds. Right. That's a small community. Like you got to realize there are so many communities within inside the community. But look, I'm gonna tell you this, and mm -hmm. this is before we wrap up because our camera dying. Mm -hmm. Um, and and I had to really envision this. What a real leader is, mm -hmm. right? A leader is not always the strongest person in the room. Mm -mm. A leader is the person that have all the relationships that mm -hmm. make sense that everybody will rally behind. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So once we develop leaders, mm -hmm. egos go out the window because you're doing it for me. You hear me? Like, mm -hmm. I work with you. Like, if I don't like you, but I like I owe him a f Like, this nigga saved my life. Mm -hmm. You did? And he said, look, I need you to work with Buddy. I got to work with Buddy. Like, just based off mm -hmm. of him, like, I got to do it. Like, it ain't no, man, nigga, I saved your life. Remember when dude had that fucking gun in your head and I asked him, please don't kill him? That's my partner. Remember that? Yeah. Nigga, work with Buddy today, nigga. Yeah, I got to work with Buddy. Ain't no fucking no or nothing of that shit. I got to go work with Buddy. Yeah. So that's what a leader is. A leader ain't the strongest person. A leader is the person with the most relationships yeah. that can make all that shit makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So gotta feel, have vision. And I feel like we have them that here. Mm -hmm. We just we just have to polish it. We just have to knock the dust off it and remind these leaders like we need we need y'all to like get out here and we gonna work on y'all behalf. But when shit get critical, we need y'all to step in and man, it's so much, man. Like like I tell you, one thing is the charter school system sucks. You know, that they, one app system. They know what they're doing. Yeah. They and it's a shame doing. because, like, we gave these people the power to dictate how our kids going to be educated. Like, you got to realize, and we, you got to, when we trust, when we vote, we actually put in our trust that this one person going to make the right decision for our lives. And, you know, realistically, they done jacked us up. And and, and the, the, the fucked up thing is, now that we speaking on this, on just having relationships in this po on this podcast, the the people that we have in leadership positions we have no relationship with, mm -hmm. like this is not Miss Landrew, like yo Moon Landrew, like we know uh Charbonnet, or uh, like these people, like I know her cousin, I went to school with her, like we don't have no relationships with a uh, Cantrell, even though she could be the greatest man in the world, right? We have no family relationships with her where we could say. Well, all right, that's the Kentrell family right there. When they from so and so, and yeah. we know her cousin, and da, 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 like that's the, because the relationship's New Orleans not there. It spiraled out of control. Like oh, yeah. this is New Orleans has always been a mixture, a mixture of different cultures, of different people from different races and nationalities. Right, right. When this was the Big Easy, you could get you a house and live at, and work at Popeyes and afford to pay your rent and everything. Rent be two hundred fifty dollars a month. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? It's amazing how far we have come from that, Ten where years. everybody knew each other. But now you got to realize we so gentrified that we don't even know our neighbors. Right. We don't know these people. We don't right. fuck with them no You more. know, people from, from, and it was a smart thing because after Katrina, you know I mean? You got to realize, I, I understood, you know, um, when Ray Nagin 
was trying to get this city um filled back up. A lot of people went to Texas, saw some great things, and said, I'm not coming back to New Orleans. Right. They went to Georgia, Atlanta. I'm not coming back to New Orleans. So the right. East was blotted right. for maybe a good bit of, i say about eight years. It was right. a minute. And had I known what I know now, uh-huh. we could have got our hands on all of this All shit. that. But see, that's what happened. See, because when they sent out that memo to the whole country, to the people, from up, be. people from up north, they was paying. They were paying three, four thousand dollars a month for rent. Hold on, how much? Hold up, you telling me I could go buy a double in New Orleans for sixty thousand dollars, right? And rent it out? I can retire. Let me let me retire. I'm gonna withdraw my four hundred one k. I'm gonna buy me about twenty houses, twenty properties. Now you talking about they got Airbnb? I'm about the Airbnb. Oh yes. And you mean and if I, I hold winning. it for sixteen years, it's gonna yeah. be worth three hundred? Yeah. So these are the things that happen. If I would have knew, you know, because at that time I was making some, uh, I was making some pretty good money. If Enough to knew, get our hands. Off. Right, right. I, I would have did the same thing. It was a lot of work that went into it. Right. You know, like cause all the houses was, were messed up. With right. the opportunity. All of them. I mean, every house was, had to be gutted. Had to, you know, um, you know, everything had to be pulled out, restructured, and everything. So it was good. But you know, like New Orleans is gentrified. Right. And we don't know our neighbors like talking about it. Right. And that's one of the biggest things that we don't have. You saying have, excuse me, co- connection, communication, having those relationships. But then we got this other thing that's fighting us. You know, like you you, you look at housewives, NBA wives, what they're always doing. There's no conflict resolution. Right. Nobody can't just talk it out. Right. We got, no matter where where they at is going down. It could be in a it can be in a a big time restaurant. They can be dressed up with all white on. If they disagree, they're gonna they're gonna act ignorant and go down. So you know what? Hence the yeah the pee wee football games. Now. Yeah, we That's love conflict. Think. Listen, love <laughs> but it wasn't like that until they started feeding us this. You gotta realize, man. Man, look, and I know we gotta get off this, but right. I remember when uh when Tupac was speaking about on um, Versace. He said Versace, Versace called him and said, "Man, look, I want you to wear my shit." Right. He was like, "Biggie." Biggie, you went and bought this stuff, but this man give me this shit to wear for free. Why? Because he knew if I get this to Tupac and tell Tupac to wear this, <laughs> Biggie gonna buy it. everybody else going to buy it. <laughs> That's just what it is. I give you an example. Nelly. Nelly came out with that song, Air Force Ones. What happened when they came out with it? Everybody went to buy Air Force Ones. Program. You know? Tupac. Tupac take his shirt off. He had that thug life tatted on his stomach, on his chest. Everybody start getting tattoos. And Uzi. And Uzi. And bald head cutting their hair off. You know, so I'm saying that we look at, and that's why we call them role models. Right. And no matter what, no matter what role they're in, they're a model for, for somebody. Right. May it be a drug, drug dealer is a role model for somebody. You know, is it negative? Yes, but they're a role model for somebody. You know, a businessman, they're a role model. A rapper, they're a role model. For people that aspire to be rappers, you know, people want to dress like the people that they admire. People want to speak like the, the the people they admire. They want right. to have the things that the people that they admire have. Right. So mm-hmm. these are the things that we look at. And back to what you said, Spider Man, with great power comes great responsibility. So as our rappers get older, look at Jay Z talking about how he had to be a better steward. You know, some of the things that he rapped about, he's trying to kind of curve the things that he directed us and he talked about in the past. You know, because when he was a child, he thought he was a child. Now he's a man, he's thinking different, right? So that's what we have to look at. You know, like, look at NBA young boy, Dude, talented, bro. Talented. But the things that this boy rap about is the reason why our young kids is out of control. Yeah, because well. they listening to him, he programming them. Yeah, and they're doing the same thing I that he do. I listened to one of them albums. I was like, Jesus Christ, that's what these kids, that's, that's the way they that's think. That's what's wrong with them now. But this is the thing. This is what Tupac said. They all know that. Tupac said that one of the lawmakers came to him and said, why you rap about violence? He said, well, if you want me to change about the things I rap about, give me different experiences. Change my life. He said, I can only rap about what I experience. So if that destruction and things are the things that I'm experiencing. If my neighbor's selling crack, that's all I can rap about because look, this is what I know. Look, I want to end this. I want to end this by saying this one thing. You hear me? And it's because <laughs> Twenty One Savage came out today and was saying that he rap about 
guns and violence and all this, but he don't promote it. And people was like, well, why you rapping about it? You promote, you promote it. it. So my thing was with Tupac was he did rap about the violence, but he all he gave you the parallels. Like he he didn't just rap about oh we gonna kill you. Blah, 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 or this gun is fucked up. He rapped about the beauty of having his mother, even though she was on crack. And like he he gave you those parallel universes of yeah, yeah these niggas won't kill me, but I still like I'm like I love kids. I won't protect kids, and I still remember. Baby. You know what I'm saying? Like I like I like he still and, showed the compassionate side, so yeah. it was able to show the parallels. And even as a parent, we learned to show our kids the parallel. They're gonna see us on um, fight with their mom they're going to see that because they're in a the house with us but we right. have to show them the parallel of look even though if we not together or whatever it, the, the case may be like I'm going to respect your mom yeah. you know what I'm saying like, they mm -hmm. have to see the parallels of it which make it they, like what make the media so bad today is that they're showing us all bad that's yeah. what it is yeah. right Yeah. because they're trying to program listen listen they, it's the agenda they we watch certain channels you understand? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, BET. We watch BET because it's black entertainment television, it won't right? Be. But pe people of European descent, they watch different channels. Like, <laughs> when we were watching VH1, they were watching MTV, right. right? There are different programs that go on those channels than they are the ones that come on ours. And the thing that's amazing is that if you go to different um different different towns or whatever, they even have different shows on their cable versus what we have. Different commercials. Every, you know, all the shit. Everything really is different. different. Like they're the not promoting different. They're not promoting right. cigarettes and malt liquor in the in a suburban white neighborhoods. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. They promote it here. And the internet just made it worse because now it's in your phone. They know who to send it to. They know what. You gotta realize that no, they need us dead. Right. They don't want us to be strong. Right. They need us dead. Man, look, you know, the reason why um Donald Trump got elected, because I know you told you said we was gonna talk about um about politics, right. but the reason why Donald Trump got elected is because white people started feeling like they were losing power once Obama got yeah, involved. Obama. Yeah. It was like a nigga got became president. Oh my God. Man, we, we done lost all our we power. Done finally fucked up. Man, everything that they're doing to our community, everything that they've ever done to our community is to keep us at that 12 and a half, 13% of the population in the United States. Right. They never want us to grow. Listen, if we stop killing each other, dude, we a problem. Because we are physically the strongest race. No race stronger than us. And Nobody we created the most like shit. And we, we don't create And we are the creators. We're the creators. Dude, you got to, you know, you know, you know what they have. They're still living off the shit we created. What they have on their side is That's the why financial. That's versus way came up. Yeah. The financial numbers. Straight. Yes. Yeah. Well, you got to realize they were worried about that also. See, the thing is, is that they're looking at it as, okay, there's more, more white babies being killed. That's why they got they worried. That's why they they read. That's why they they turned it over because they mm -hmm. was like, we need y'all to stop killing these white babies because our population numbers are, are decreasing. Not just because of African Americans, but more because of the Hispanics. Mm -hmm. right. See, Hispanics ain't killing each other at the rate that we killing. Right, each other. they fucking and fucking and fucking. They fucking and fucking and fucking. And, and you know what? <laughs> like we was the largest minority, but they passed us up. I don't right. know if y'all know that. Right, right. They passed us up. So, they stay twelve, so you gotta realize. Not only are they procreating, but they got motherfuckers that's coming across Mexican, the Mexican border every day. And they're constantly growing and growing and growing and growing. And once they unite... Once they unite, that's what it is. But they so busy programming the niggas that they, that they can't they, they, they can't about. run two programs at one time. Like, they got, they but got we a, can't let up off these niggas. They got a problem yeah. on their hands. They can't and let up off these niggas, but these Mexicans, what? these motherfuckers is relentless. You hear me? See, they, bro. They, so what they're trying to do right now is they're trying to build relationships with the Hispanic community. Right. Like they're trying to get Hispanics to be Republicans. Right. See, you got to realize that they're trying to make they what they what they're trying to build is a gap, kind of like um, if you know about you know back in the G, you know you had the whites and they had they had classism, right? right. So you had the upper class, the ones who had money, right? right. You had the lower class that was the trailer park white people, but then you had I, I listened to a whole African American about the caste, <laughs> right? There we go. So you got to realize how we can have money, but the people with, with the people that had the money don't hate us as much as the trailer park white people. Right. Because this is what they, they taught them. They taught them that I don't give a fuck if you broke or not. 
you still better than any nigga. Right. Hmm. So that's why if you get into it, it be the raggediest Caucasian or European people of descent that want to rag on you and talk to you the worst. Right. Because of the hatred. And you may have more than them, but they hate us more than the people what that Jay-Z have What Jay-Z says, money. still a nigga. Here oh, nigga. Yep. So that's what it is, man. Man, bro. look, Coach Buddy, I want to thank you for this conversation because... You know how we go. Like yeah. we we sit outside at Garetti and we go for two three hours at the <laughs> practice every yeah. ten o'clock practice. We definitely got to get another one in, <laughs> yeah. man. Because right, right. buddy practice already going to end later than everybody else <laughs> practice. Then we gonna stay out there and talk to like ten ten thirty. So we yeah, gonna yeah. Yeah, that's just how we gonna do it. Almost five days a week and we out there. Oh, you hear me? Um, I really appreciate your time, bro. I know you a busy man. You dig and um and. Uh, and and I really want to say that I really just wanted to invite you here to give you your flowers, Jeremy, and let you tell a lot of your story that, yeah. a, pe- that a lot of people don't know. And we're going to do more because, like I said, we about to start doing documentaries, all type of stuff like that it, because we want to put stuff in stone yeah. and media, like put that good media out to converse what, what else is out there. You know what I'm saying? So I just want to thank you for coming out. And and to music by studios, Benjamin's Room Podcast, episode yeah. what 16? sixteen, episode sixteen. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. You did any any last words you want to say to? Man, listen, man. Uh, as we said, bro, with great power comes great responsibility. You know, I think it's extremely important that each one grab one and teach one. You mm-hmm. know, and it, it starts with us. You know, it starts with us, man. Um, shout out to my mom and my dad. I love y'all. You know, they got their anniversary coming up in two weeks. You know, they're going to be 30, 36 years, I think. Wow. 37 years. One of them. Yeah. Wow. Shout out to my wife, man. I love you, baby. You know, we, we made 18 years. Wow. Uh, married 25 years together. You know, uh, and shout out to the whole New Orleans. You know, um, the great thing about life and about God is we can be whatever we want one day. But every time we have, we we uh, go to sleep and wake up, we have the opportunity to change, change uh, our future. You know, we can't change our past; we can change our future. You know, so if we were broke one day, we can go to sleep and wake up and say, you know what, I'm going to get it today. You know, we can be hurt one day, go to sleep, wake up. God gives us an opportunity to change it and get things right with Him. You know what I'm saying? So, shouts out to New Orleans, shouts out to the family, shouts out to the G Garetti. You know. And, uh, and I thank y'all for having me here, man. Thank Appreciate you for you, coming man. through. Thank you, brother. This is Benjamin's Room, episode 16, and we out. Yes, Lord. <laughs>